Good afternoon, students. Welcome back to another session. In today's lesson, we will be learning about, we will be um, distinguishing between the symbiotic relationships that exist within marine ecosystems. We will look at examples of the different symbiotic relationships, and we will also learn about the advantages and disadvantages of symbiotic relationships involving a few marine organisms. As a part of our first activity, I invite you to turn to page 20 in your student activity book. Kindly take out your student activity book and turn to page 20. Okay, if you do not have one, you can share with Leticia next to you. I would like you to write the word coral reef in the middle. Page 20. Coral reefs, right? Coral reefs in the middle of your graphic organizer. Now, according to the worksheet, it says, add describing words about your topic between the spokes. This is a graphic organizer. It helps us to condense information. Now, it says, add describing words. And describing words give details or clarity to information. Provides a picture of whatever we're going to talk about. And our topic is coral reefs. I want you to think about the different names of marine species and add a describing word to them. For example, I can say a huge shark. The describing word I have used here, students, is huge. And this is one of the marine species. So you can use a describing word and add the names of marine species on the worksheet. Okay, we have one minute to get this activity done. So all the various marine species that we have in the country of Belize that can be found in our marine ecosystem, and there are many of them. Yes, you can write, see lionfish? What word are you using to describe the lionfish? Exactly, that's a very nice word. So you could write colorful lionfish there, and then you try and fill up the gaps. After you have finished that task, I also encourage you to turn to the person to the right of you. So Kyle will turn to the right of Serafina, and I want you to start talking about the function of coral reefs. Why are the coral reefs so important to us? What role do they play in our environment? This is correct. Okay, most students are filling the names of the different marine species. I will be calling, some, calling the names of a few of you to share with me your responses. Yadira, what marine species did you come up with? A small sardine. A small sardine, okay. Let me write that here. Rosalina, and speak louder. A tiny polyp, okay, that is correct. Tiny polyp. Richie? Stealthy I did not hear the first word, sir. Stealthy. Stealthy. Stingrays. Stingrays. Okay. Stealthy. I'm going to pick another student. Marcelina. Colorful. colorful snappers. We also have colorful fish hair. Kyle? Thank you very much. Endangered. Manantees. Now we're going to look at the functions of coral reefs. Why are the coral reefs so important? What are their functions? What purposes do they serve? The functions of coral reefs. Yadira? The land from natural disaster and also helps in, in not having sea, sea erosion. Very good, Nadira. It protects the land.
protects the land from natural disasters and sea erosion. Edwin, another purpose of coral reefs ecosystem? It's a home for fishes. It, pro it provides a home for juvenile fish. Very good, Edwin. So it can be used as a habitat. Amir? Okay, maybe I could pick another person. Steven? So it's, it is a breeding ground. Based on research students, I found out that coral reefs support a phenomenal diversity of species and provide irreplaceable sources of food and shelter. One of you had mentioned that here. Coral reefs are important as shelter and feeding grounds for a variety of fish species. It also supports a variety of human needs, such as subsistence. There are many of our local fishermen that take out their boats every day in search of fish. For fisheries, tourism, shoreline protection, and it yields compounds that are important in the development of new medicines. Coral reefs also serve as natural barriers that protect nearby shorelines from eroding forces of the sea. Someone had mentioned it prevents erosion, thereby protecting coastal dwellings, agricultural land, and beaches. Coral reefs also help to remove and recycle carbon dioxide, which is a gas that contributes to global warming. Coral reefs have been used in the treatment of cancer, HIV, cardiovascular diseases that have to do with your heart, ulcers, and other ailments. It has example, coral skeletons can be used by humans as a bone substitute in reconstructive surgery. Do you understand that, um, students? That coral, the corals itself can be used as bones if you're doing a reconstructive surgery? Okay. Coral reef destinations are recognized as the biggest tourism attraction. It brings in a lot of income for your country. And the tourism industry, a lot of people make money. It's an income earner for our families. Coral reefs support, support the food chain by providing food for tropical fish and other marine animals that serve as food for animals higher in the food chain. This one is also very important, students. Coral reefs are also a useful educational tool. People, including our teachers, can learn about biomes and ecosystems and the interrelationship between orga organisms and their environment. Corals are animals in the phylum Cnidaria. Cnidarians are also include sea fans, sea pansies, and anemones. And corals are in the class Antizoa, and can be divided further into stony corals, the builders of coral reefs, and soft corals. We have two types of corals, hard corals and soft corals. Their coral reefs are made up of hundreds of coral polyps, and I believe someone had mentioned that word over here. A coral polyp is an invertebrate. It's a tiny animal that lives in the coral itself. It is the single living unit of a coral and the creature responsible for our coral reefs. It has a ring of tentacles that surrounds the mouth, which helps to capture its food. The tentacles contain stinging cells called nematosis, which further aid in capturing foods. Calcium carbonate is secreted by the corals to build a protective home for the coral polyps. Zooxanthellae are single cell organisms or plants that convert the sun's energy into food. They also give corals their brilliant colors. Coral reefs need water that is between 62 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And most coral reefs you would find located along the eastern shores of land. 
Reef usually develop in areas that have a lot of wave action because the waves bring in food, nutrients, and oxygen to the reef. Waves also prevent sediments from falling on the reef and smothering the, the corals. They best grow in sunny, shallow water that helps corals so that they can get access to sunlight, which is essential in carrying out photosynthesis. That is how they make their, their nutrients. The sun is the main source of energy for the coral reef ecosystem. And the zooxanthellae, which is an algae slash plants, provides food to the coral through photosynthesis. We're now going to be looking at a, at a documentary. Kindly take note of the information that is going to be shared because I will be asking a few questions. It's entitled Living Together, a guide to symbiosis on coral reefs. Coral reefs, sometimes referred to as the rainforest of the sea due to the vast abundance of life they sustain. They are found across the world though mainly in the tropics. Together, they make up a mere one-tenth of a percent of the ocean surface area, or roughly half the size of France. Despite this meagre size, they are home to 25% of the ocean's creatures and over 5,000 species of fish make their homes on the reefs. Coral reefs are actually made up of millions of small individual animals called polyps which form large colonies. Each polyp secretes a hard carbonate exoskeleton which provides support and protection for the body of each polyp. When a polyp dies, new polyps build their exoskeleton on top of the old one. Over time, new reefs are formed. Coral reefs are located in areas where the seas are warm and relatively shallow, with the optimum temperature being between 26 and 31 degrees centigrade. Such seas tend to be devoid of nutrient-rich water, usually found in areas of cold water upwellings where corals cannot survive. Because of this, corals have adapted a mutually beneficial relationship with algae to provide their food source. Inside the sac of each coral polyp lives a one-celled algae called zooxanthellae. The algae gives off oxygen during photosynthesis and provides energy that the coral polyp needs to live. In return, the polyp gives the algae carbon dioxide and nitrogen, as well as a protective home within the carbon exoskeleton. That is why coral reefs grow so near the surface of the water where it is sunniest. The algae needs sunshine for photosynthesis. The relationship between the coral polyps and zooxanthellae is a form of symbiosis. Symbiosis literally means living together and describes relationships between different species. There are three types of symbiosis. The first, as in the case of coral polyps and zooxanthellae, is called mutualism. This is where both organisms benefit from the interaction with the other and neither organism is harmed in the process. Mutualistic relationships can be either facultative, where the relationship is not essential for the survival of either species, or obligate, where the interaction between the two species is essential for both their survival. The example of the coral and the algae is an example of obligate mutualism, where without one another, both will die. This explains why coral reef ecosystems are so fragile, given the narrow environmental parameters in which they can flourish. Many of the other plants and animals that live in and around the coral reef have also evolved symbiotic relationships to help in the struggle for survival in what is a deceivingly hostile habitat. One of the most iconic symbols of symbiosis on the reef is that of the clownfish and the stinging anemone. In this mutualistic relationship, the anemone provides a protective home for the clownfish, which is not affected by the stinging cells of the anemone as are other fish. It is believed that the clownfish have evolved a special mucus which is gradually acclimatised to the anemone's sting so that it no longer views it as prey. When the anemone catches a fish in its tentacles, the clownfish eats any scraps that are left and also feeds on the particles excreted by the anemone. They also keep the anemone free of parasites and algae. In return, the anemone is protected by the clownfish from its predators and they have also been documented catching fish and feeding the anemone. As well as clownfish, some other species of damselfish are also impervious to the stinging cells of certain anemones, as in the case of this small black damselfish. It is not just the clownfish that keep the anemone free from parasites and algae. As demonstrated here in its carpet anemone, 
a saddleback clownfish are ever present, but in this case there are a number of small glass cleaner shrimps delicately combing the surface of the anemone for any small morsels of food. A further example of mutualism can be found in the relationship between the yellow prawn goby and the pistol shrimp. In this relationship the goby lives in a burrow made and maintained by the industrious shrimp which just happens to be almost totally blind. Thus when it emerges from the burrow with its recent excavations it is open to predation. This is where the goby steps in by becoming the eyes of the shrimp in return for the protection of the burrow. The shrimp will usually keep an antenna in constant contact with the goby. If the goby senses danger, it beats its tail against the shrimp's antenna, signalling for it to retreat into the burrow, followed by the goby. As well as being provided with a home, the goby also feeds off small invertebrate exposed by the shrimp's work. The examples so far have involved symbiotic relationships between two separate species. However, some mutualisms extend beyond this relationship between numerous species. An example of this is the occurrence of cleaning stations on the reef. Fish and other species often travel for considerable distances to attend these cleaning stations where tiny cleaner rats or bronze cleaner partner shrimp swim and hop into the open mouths and gill slits of the fish. Whilst doing this, they remove growths and parasites from the fish that would otherwise cause them illness or harm. The amazing thing about this relationship is that often these fish are predatory and would normally eat smaller fish and crustaceans like the cleaners. At the cleaning stations, however, there is no risk of predation, as the fish patiently wait for the cleaning to be completed. Some instinct tells the larger predators that the cleaners are providing a service that they cannot do without. The cleaners benefit by obtaining a free meal, and the fish benefit by being kept clean and therefore free of illness. As well as mutualism, there are two other forms of symbiosis. Commensualism describes a relationship between two organisms where one benefits and the other is not significantly harmed or helped. An example of this occurs where remora fish attach themselves to the bodies of large pelagic fish such as whale sharks. They attach themselves via a large suction pad on their head, which does not harm the shark. The remora, however, benefits by being afforded protection due to the shark's presence and by the increased access to food as the shark travels. Another form of commensalism is called metabiosis. Metabiosis is where one organism benefits from the death of another organism. An example of this is shown in hermit crabs which inhabit the empty shells left after the death of a sea snail or other gastropod. As hermit crabs grow, they seek out larger shells to accommodate their growing body. In this case, a white spotted hermit crab has nearly outgrown its current home and is in the market for a new larger shell. However, upon closer inspection it appears that the shell is still inhabited by a snail and so the crab continues on its quest for a larger shell. The third form of symbiosis is called parasitism, which occurs when the symbiont, or parasite, benefits at the expense of the host. An example of this found on the coral reef is that of Christmas tree worms. Christmas tree worms are small filter feeders that feed on planktonic life filtered out of the water. They settle upon coral and bore into the hard coral shell by secreting a mixture of mucus and sand. These secretions form a tube inside the coral, killing the polyps and damaging the coral structure as it does so. Once settled in its tube, the worm then extends its colourful, feather-like tentacles out into the water and begins feeding. The worm benefits from the elevated position providing a good flow of water and from the protection afforded to it by its new burrow whilst the coral polyp is killed. In order to live together, the animals of the reef employ various forms of symbiosis. The examples shown are of only a few in the web of the reef. 
There are a multitude of connections and it is important to realise that all things and all the processes on the reef, as in the rainforests of the Amazon or the open plains of the savannah, rely on each other. Coral reefs and tropical waters owe their existence to a symbiotic relationship, that between the coral polyp and the zooxanthellae. Without this mutually beneficial relationship, the whole web of life on a coral reef would fall apart. If we fail to act and do not strive to protect these habitats, the effect will be disastrous for us all. Now we just watch a very interesting video on symbiosis. Okay, it says based on the documentary, what words were used to describe the coral reefs of the world? What phrase were was used to describe the coral reefs? Rainforests of the sea. Coral reefs are referred to as rainforests of the sea because of its abundance diverse marine life and the flora and fauna that exist in that particular environment. What primary material is a coral reef built from? Polyps, okay. Another student. Go ahead. To some extent, the coral polyps after they die the corals that are left behind, they fuse and they become hard. The, cor the coral itself gives off calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, C-A-C-O-3. And the common name for calcium carbonate is called limestone. Limestone is usually found in white minerals, marbles and rock. And this Substance here is what is used to make the coral reefs. After the coral polyps die, like what Adita said, they become hard after a while, their skeleton remain, and co new corals form on the, the skeletons that are left behind. So coral reefs are made from calcium carbonate. In which regions of the world would we find most of our coral reefs? Where can we find most of the coral reefs in the world? Okay, coral reefs can be found in most in the tropical areas that have a lot of sun. Coral reefs grow in warm, shallow waters. They need access to sunlight. How are marine species able to adapt in marine ecosystems? The documentary just now on symbiosis, which says symbiosis means living to living together. How are these marine species able to adapt and survive they help one another, they help one another. Yeah. now another question that i can ask how do they help one another what do they have to form in order to help one another steven yeah. relation very good class they have to form relationships and what does the word relationships mean? What does the word relationship mean? Edwin to the back. Relationship means like um, a connection between those two or more. Um, that is the word I want to hear, Edwin. Thanks very much. A connection between two parties or two organisms. A connection between in this case we are talking about marine species the video highlighted three forms of relationships that can be formed between or amongst marine species are you from are you um, familiar with any of them you remember the terms that were used think about the terms that were used Ashley come on give it a try parasitism okay that is correct, Ashley, and very good. Someone had, another student had their hand up to the back. Rosalina? Mutualism. Mutualism, thank you very much. That is also correct. And Edwin had his hand up. Common 
commensalism. Very good, Edwin, commensalism. Now we are going to discuss each type, each one of these form of symbiotic relationship. Symbiosis basically means living together and in the context of marine biology refers to a close relationship between two, two species. We just mentioned that students. Mutualism. Mutualism is a close relationship where both parties benefit. Now based on the video, do you recall any two marine organisms that were shown that demonstrated mutualism? Kyle? The anemone and the, the clownfish. Very good, Kyle. The sea anemone. Sorry. Anemone and the clownfish. How do these two species interact? How do they benefit each other? Kyle again. The anemone provides protection for the clownfish. Very good, Kyle. The sea anemone has stinging tentacles that are called nemat nematocysts. N-E-M-A, nematocysts. C-Y-S-T-S. These are stinging tentacles. And if any predator is coming near to the, clung the clungfish, the sea anemone will protect the clungfish. The clungfish, in return, is a cleaner. It will remove all the fungus and parasites from off the sea anemone, and it will also eat its crops. So both of these animals are in a mutualistic relationship. According to the slide there, we have the relationship between the gobby fish and the shrimp. Do you remember those two, that example that was shown? How did the shrimp help the gobby fish? Steven? Clean off parasites. And how did the shrimp benefit from the gobby fish? Protection and also a place to live. Because the gobby fish builds a burrow, like a little hole in the sand. And then both of those animals cohabitate. Both of them live in the burrow. Whenever a predator is coming, the gobby fish touches the tentacles of the shrimp. Remember, the shrimp is partially blind, so it cannot see. And it relies on the gobby fish to protect it from predators. The shrimp also attract prey. And whenever they come closer to the gobby fish, it gets its food. So the shrimp digs a burrow in the sand and both organisms live there. Humans have a, mutual, a mutualistic relationship with microorganisms. We have bacteria that are living inside our abdominal cavity, primarily bacteria in the digestive, digestive tract. Sorry. Now why do you think we have bacteria in our digestive tract? We have bacteria in our digestive tract to help us break down our foods that we eat. Excellent, Richie. Remember, our foods go through a particular process, digestion. And so the, di the bacteria in our digestive tract helps to break down the food. Also, human provides a warm area for that bacteria to live. Shrimp is immune to the stinging tentacles of sea anemone, and it hides it near to be protected from predators. The shrimp attacks prey for the sea anemone. We just spoke about the one with the, clung, the clungfish. We're going to be looking at commensalism. Which two organisms in the video documentary spoke about commensalism? The remora fish and the? The remora fish and the whale. Come on, students. And the whale shark. We had the remora fish cohabitating with the whale shark. The remora fish has an elongated body and it, it attaches itself to the whale. Sometimes it can be a stingray, it could be a shark, it can be a turtle. And it sucks, it uses its jaw to suck. It feeds off remnants of scraps and food and even smaller fish that the whale shark does not catch. The whale shark does not benefit in any way. 
The remora fish is the organism that is benefiting in the commensalism. In commensalism, only one species benefit. The other organism is un unharmed. It has examples. You have the cattle egret. We we'll, we'll eat insects that have been disturbed when the cattle forage. You might have seen this um, example before when you have a lot of cattle in an open area and when they move their feet up, their foot up, uh, they stir up a lot of insects and that is where the cattle egret benefits. It eats the insects that are stirred up in the air. A hermit crab taking shelter in an empty seashell. A spider building a web on a tree. Those are examples of commensalism. The spider is benefiting, the tree is not harmed. The remora hitching a ride on a shark. They call the remora a hitchhiker. It's using the shark as a form of transportation, a free ride it's getting in the ocean. Orchids growing in tall tropical trees in an effort to get sunlight. There are some, there are some plants like the epiphytes that have adopted special aerial structures and they grow on the tallest trees in the rainforest. And they grow on those trees because they're trying to get access to air, water, and nutrients. We also have barnacles. Barnacles are arthropods. Last year on the news, they showed a turtle that was captured in the Gales Point area, and that turtle was extremely old. They were able to de detect that it was old because of the marks it had on its shell, the age, as well as the amount of barnacles. Now these barnacles become a nuisance to the turtles. They attach themselves to whales and turtles and they gain access to nutrient-rich waters. They are also considered hitchhikers. Humans use dogs as pets and for protection purposes. How do the dogs use Edwin to the back. They, de they depend on us to um, feed them or give them the things that they need. Very that good, they Edwin. Get, things that they couldn't they rely on us for a shelter, a habitat, and for food, for survival. Whereas we use them for pet and for protection. Those are all examples of commensalism where you find one is benefit and the other is unharmed. In a mutualistic relationship, we have. Both species benefited. Now we're going to look at the third form of symbiotic relationship. And this one is called parasitism. What do you know about parasites? Yadira, what do you know about parasites? They are usually microscopic and harmful. They're usually microscopic and harmful. Very good. Another student. Evelyn, are you familiar with the term parasites? Okay. In our next activity, I will be calling on you, okay? I want you to participate. Parasites are harmful to the host. What do we mean by the host? Edwin? The, um, the living being that it's getting um, its, its supplies from or its needs. The living being or the living organism that the parasite will be living inside of. So it says powerful, parasites are harmful to their host. In such a relationship, one organism benefit, while the other one usually dies or after a gradual time, that animal or that organism become ill. It says ectoparasites, ecto, live on the outside of a host. And endoparasite, the prefix endo referring to inside. Endoparasites live on the inside of the host. Now, have you heard about the tapeworm? It attaches itself to the intestinal wall and it feeds on your nutrients and on your blood. Eventually, it can affect the human being. That species will have to get some form of medication, oral medication. How long can a tapeworm grow? Kyle? 30 feet or more. They also have another example of parasitism. You have the leech that lives in water. It's a form of a worm. And it attaches its mouth, its jaw, to the, the host. And it sucks blood from other animals such as fish. You have ticks. 
Which species does it take likes to affect? The dogs. Dogs are always running through grasses. And so as they run, they pick up the ticks on their body. So ticks attach themselves to dogs as they run through lawns and grasses. The ticks feeds off blood. Eventually, the ticks harm the dogs if the dogs does not get any treatment. Now, there is another type of symbiotic relationship, but this one is not so um, familiar. It's called mimicry. Mimicry is another symbiotic relationship less common than the others. Mimicry is a relationship in which one species mimics another, typically using color or pattern, and we would refer to that as camouflage. They change their color, their pattern to resemble another species, and that is how they survive. So we have learned about the four different kinds of symbiotic relationships already. What are their, what are their, their students? Mutualistic. Commensalism, commensalism and parasitism, mimicry. Okay, now we're going to play a game. I will be passing around these, this container here and you will take a paper from here. You can select the person next to you to work with you. You are going to read the example given there and determine whether it is parasitism, mutualis mutualism, Commensalism or mimicry. Pass it quickly. Take one and we work in pairs. And then we're going to answer them together. Work in pairs. Quickly. And when we are reading the examples, I encourage you to speak out loudly. Can you pass the container forward, Edwin? The other two students. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I believe almost everyone is finished at this time. Let's start off with the group right here, and we will go around. Yeah. So remember, we have to speak. Sorry, we'll start off from here. We speak loudly. Quickly, Kyle. Leeches cling to a turtle's skin and suck blood and microorganisms from the turtle, not to mention valuable food and nutrients. What uh, kind of parasitism? parasitism? Very good. Amir and his partner. Number nine, go ahead, sir. Number nine, uh, tuberculosis in a human is a microbe that lives off the tissue of the human lungs, causing, Ill causing illness in a person. What Tuber is the type of relationship? Tuberculosis is a, is a um, form of par parasitism. Parasitism, because after a while, the human becomes ill and has to be hospitalized, Why? where medication can be given. I did not hear you. Why? Because the tuberculosis is harming the human body while it is feeding on a long tissue. Very good, Amir and Richie. Let us call on Stephen. Stephen and Evelyn. The Oxpecker bird and the rhinoceros have a relationship. One Oxpecker receives protection and obtains food from the ticks and other pests infesting the rhino's skin. One rhino receives in return feeding and early warning of approaching danger. So what type of relationship would that be? Mutualism. Mutualism. Very good. We have Glendy and Myrna. And what is the type of relationship? Parasitism. Very good. So we understand the different types of symbi symbiosis. It says environmental factors that affect marine ecosystems. Now, it is very interesting to know that these animals cohabitat and they have found unique ways in which they can adapt and survive in our coral reef system. But there are many environmental factors some as a result of human activities that are affecting the coral reefs. It says coral reefs are being destroyed at an alarming rate. It is estimated that we have already lost 10% of the world's reefs. And some scientists say that in the next 50 years, 
our coral reefs will become, to some extent, extinct. The destruction is often connected with human activities such as pollution. We have sewage, erosion, irresponsible fishing, poor tourism practices, and global warming. And in our previous lesson, what did we say that what did we say is global warming? What did we say is global warming? Glendy, speak up loudly. Let me hear from Edwin. You had your hand up. Global warming is, is a rise in average temperature of the earth. Uh, it's a rise in the increase of earth. Kyle, you want to add to it? It's the depletion of the ozone layer that causes the earth to get hotter. I did not hear you. Can you kind of repeat properly? Depletion of the ozone layer that causes the earth to get hotter. Yes, the, with the greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases absorbing the infrared radiation. And it, re it leads to an increase in the Earth's average temperature. Okay, the first environmental factor we have is hurricanes. Hurricanes cause physical damages to the coral reefs. And please remember, coral reef takes millions of years to form. I ask that you pay keen attention to the slide, Adita. Thank you. And the young lady next to you. Hurricanes also contribute to smothering due to increased level of sediments. The zooxanthellae and the algae, algae cannot survive if they are smothered with a lot of sediments that are washed in by the wave action. We have freshwater poisoning. We have destruction of other ecosystems upon which coral reefs depend. We look at another factor, tsunamis. Tsunamis create gigantic waves, which results in physical damage of our coral reefs. Also, they contribute to erosion, the washing away of our soil, and possible disruption of reproduction and recruitment. We look at volcanoes. Volcanoes will produce a lot of heat, and some of our aquatic animals cannot survive in water, sea and ocean water that have increased temperature. Volcanoes will also contribute to smothering and sedimentation. Predators. We have predators that might travel from one part of the world to our seas, and they will affect the different marine species that we have. We have prong of thorns, starfish, snails, parrotfish, and the butterfly fish. Have you heard about the lionfish? Yes. Most of you have heard about it. What can you tell me about the lionfish? And I want somebody who has not shared to share with me. Venom, go ahead. Somebody wants to help Myrna? One more person that can help Myrna? Yes, the lionfish is a venomous species. It traveled from very far, from some part of the Pacific, and it came into our seas. And we heard that the new Stephen, some people said it's good to eat. I have not eaten it as yet, but I would have to do research to find out if that is an edible fish. Okay, but I was told that it's very dangerous to other marine species. Yes, Amir? A lionfish is like a stone that got spices on his back. Yes, it has a lot of spikes. And that is how it affects its, the predators that it wants to destroy. Releases that venomous substance in the water and it kills them. Thank you very much. We have competitors such as algae and coral bleaching. Do you know about coral be bleaching? Yeah. We are hearing yes. I want to see the raise of hand if you know about coral bleaching so that you can share. Rosalina to the back. You raise your hand up. What is coral bleaching? When the corals lose their color. Lose their color. That's part of it. That's very good. What happens to the zooxanthellae? That algae. What happens to the algae? The increase in temperature in our ocean and seas causes stress on the corals. And as a result, the algae is expelled. And the corals, remember now, the corals and the algae, they have a mutualistic relationship. They're obligate, they have to be present. The coral polyps and the algae have to be present for both of them to survive. So if the algae is expelled, if it is removed from the coral polyps, then the corals will 
What will eventually happen to the corals? They will die because they need the nutrients coming from the algae. Okay, and so coral bleaching is the whitening of our coral reefs. They lose their zooxanthellae. There's a sharp changes in salinity. Heavy UV light exposure, which is not good for the coral reefs. And higher than usual ocean temperature. We have pathogens. Pathogens are bacteria and viruses that transmit diseases. Just like how a human being can catch a disease, our coral reefs can be affected by different pathogens. We have overfishing. Overfishing creates an ecological imbalance in the food chain. And there's some fishermen who do not respect open and closed season, and so they, they want to fish all year along. They do not give some of our juvenile fish time to reproduce and time to grow. And there are also laws that if they are caught with juvenile fish, they are charged penalties, as well as their fishing boat, their vessel can be taken away as well. What kind of um, destructive fishing practices have you heard about or are you familiar with? Destructive fishing practices, besides overfishing. When, um, when some fishermen anchor their everything they can, Go ahead. destroy the coral. And they do dredging. They pull up everything from the sea floor, and they only take what they want. And so what do you think happens to the rest of the, the um, marine feces that comes up? They're just thrown out. Yes, Kyle? Another one is the propellers from the boats. Yes, that are killing, that is killing a lot of our marine species. Ex example in Manante. We have heard on the news over and over that in different parts of our country, Belize, the Manante has been chopped or cut or injured by propellers. We also have development. More and more we see on the news that people are building huge resorts in areas that are close to marine ecosystems. And as they do dredging, as they dig or dug up the soil, it causes sedimentation and it leads to smothering of our algae. We have pollutants and nutrients, sewage, pesticides, fertilizers that run off from the different industries, heavy metals and pathogens, and all of these leads to contamination of our water sources. We have the alien species, and we spoke about the lionfish a while ago. Pioneer species, they travel from afar to compete for space, nutrients, and sunlight. And the lionfish is one of those pioneer species. We also have pollution from mines and return flows from irrigation resulting in water quality, including nutrient buildup and salinization. Dams, interbasin transfers, and hydroelectrical flow releases. Irrigation and mining obstruction creates a change in a flow regime or, or hydrology. I ask you to kindly turn to page 23 in your workbook. And you can work in pairs. Yes, this one. Okay, it's a very short symbiotic quiz. And it's just simply to test us in regards to the key information that we learned this afternoon. Consists of eight questions, and you can work with a partner to help you. The first one says, what does symbiosis mean? A, and I want you to share your answer in your book. Living separately, no relationship between two species, or B, living together, close relationship between two species. Share your answer in your book. Using the palliative sticks 
to select volunteers to share their responses. The first one says, what does symbiosis mean? Living separately, no relationship between two species, or is it B, living together, close relationship between two species? Rosalina? Living together, B, living together, close relationship between two species. Very good, Rosalina. The next item, what type of mutual, what type of relationship is mutualism? A, one species benefits and the other is not affected at all, or B, both species benefit from the relationship. Adita. Um, B, both species involved benefit from the relationship. Very good, Adita. The third item, what is commensalism? A, one species benefit, and we are looking at the advantages and disadvantages right here. One species benefit, and the other is not affected at all, or B, one species benefit, and the other is harm in the process. Yadira? Come on. A, one species benefit, and the other is not affected at all. Very good, Yadira. The fourth item, what is parasitism? A, neither species has contact with one another, or B, one species benefits and the other is harm in the process. Marcelina. B, one species benefits and the other is harmful. Excellent, Marcelina. Number five might be a little difficult for you. Symbiosis is always interspecific, B, intraspecific. Ashley? A, interspecific. Interspecific. Very good, Ashley. Number six. Commensalism usually occurs between a species that is vulnerable to various types of weather, producers, or predation, predators. Okay, the answer there is predation. And number seven, we're almost finished. In parasitic relationships, the host, number seven is to the back student. The host health is always impaired by the other species that is benefiting from them. How is their health impaired? Over a long period of time or B, a short period of time in a parasitic relationship? Marcelina? B, over a period of time. Over a long period of time, A. And number eight, why is symbiosis so important? Now, who would, who would want to challenge this question here? Why is symbiosis important? It has, it allows ecosystems to overlap and become dependent on each other for survival. It gets rid of all parasites or it kills all the predators. Yes, Evelyn, and thanks for raising your hand. Evelyn? to overlap and become dependent on each other for survival. Very good, Evelyn. And so this activity brings us to the end of our lesson for this afternoon. Just a simple review, students. We learned about four different types of symbiotic relationships. Mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, and mimicry. In mutualism, two species or two parties benefit in commensalism. One species benefit while the other is unaffected or unharmed. And in parasitism, one species benefit and the other is harmed. In mimicry, we see one species camouflaging itself to look as another species. Thank you very much, students.